Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us today. It looks like the, you know, most people have uh, signed on. Uh, welcome to the fifth in our series of uh, EHS educational webinars uh, this summer. Uh, today, uh, my colleague Kevin Eric is going to provide a presentation on RICRA solid and hazardous waste regulatory update. Uh, and for those of you, some of you are quite familiar with our format here, so uh, we'll go uh, approximately an hour. And at the end of the presentation, if you have questions, we will cover those. If you do have a question, I kindly ask that you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. Type your question at the end of the presentation. We'll go through the, uh, the questions. If we run out of time, we'll still email you a uh, the answer to your uh, question. So again, thank you for uh, joining us today, and I will turn it over to my colleague, Kevin. Thank you, Leo. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining our webinar today on RICRA Solid and Hazardous Waste Management. Uh, my name is Kevin Eric. I'm an environmental consultant here at NSAFE and one of NSAFE's uh, RICRA subject area leads. Um, as uh, Leo said, this, today's topic is our fifth topic to cover in our 2020 uh, educational uh, webinar series. Um, at the conclusion of today's webinar, uh, we will send out a copy, a handout copy of today's presentation. There will also be a, a short survey and we, we will also issue a certificate of attendance for everyone who attended and send that to you. So uh, without further ado, let's begin. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. So RICRA Solid and Hazardous Waste Regulatory Update. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to cover some recent uh, updates to RICRA Solid and Hazardous Waste Regulations. And these are the topics that we're gonna cover as part of uh, today's discussion. Uh, COVID-19 policies for s signing shipping documents. Um, obviously very relevant given um, the circumstances uh, that we're going through, unfortunately, uh, during these days. So we'll cover uh, EPA and DOT's COVID-19 policies for signing documents. Um, we'll also just briefly cover uh, a recent update to the ignitable characteristic um, that EPA is recently published. Uh, also covering aerosols that were recently added to the universal waste rule on the federal level. And then lastly, we'll uh, cover uh, high, high level topics on the generator improvements rule. <clears throat> so the first topic is EPA and DOT COVID-19 policies for signing shipping documents. So as I mentioned, obviously this is relevant and uh, you some of you may find this very useful where um, you might have limited personnel who are available to sign a shipping document. Um, obviously, you know, someone who is designated to sign a uh, hazardous waste manifest, for example, needs to be RICRA trained and DOT trained. Um, and some facilities may just have one or two people that are designated for that. Um, and so given the circumstances that we are in with COVID-19, um, EPA and DOT have recognized social distancing restrictions and potential worker shortages that may impede the ability of a generator and or a shipper to sign a hazardous waste manifest and or uh, a bill of lading. So EPA and uh, the Department of Transportation have issued uh, their own memorandums and policies to provide flexibility uh, with respect to signatures on paper shipping documents uh, such as the Uniform Hazardous Waste Manifest or uh, a simple bill of lading for shipping a hazardous material. Uh, DOT's COVID-19 policy was issued on April 10th of this year, which states that a shipper may ask a person to sign on its behalf, i.e. to enter the shipper's name as the signature for the shipper certification on the shipping paper. Uh, the request uh, may be made verbally or in writing and also may be electronically transmitted uh, either uh, via text or email. Uh, EPA's COVID-19 policy was issued on May 18th of this year, 
uh, as it relates to a generator signing a uniform hazardous waste manifest, and they provide some options uh, in that policy. And the first option includes signing up for EPA's e-manifest um, protocol. And so there is, uh, as many of you may know, um, EPA uh, passed the e-manifest um, uh, policy or procedure a few years ago. Uh, it's a voluntary system. However, in this, uh, in these circumstances that we are in today, it, it's very relevant uh, and you may choose to uh, use the e-manifest system in, in lieu of using a hard copy uh, manifest for shipping hazardous waste. And so instructions for setting up an e-manifest account are at the following link. And you will need to register, uh, if you choose to use that option, register for e-manifest on the RICRA info website, which is provided there. Other options include, um, as it relates to generator signing of a uniform hazardous waste manifest, if, if an electronic manifest is not feasible, the transporter uh, should write the name of the generator in box 15 and under signature write generator using signature substitute due to COVID-19. So uh, again, if you have, if you're in a situation where you need to ship some hazardous waste and you do not have someone um, available in person to sign that document, this is a, a feasible option um, that you can have the transporter uh, write the name of the generator in box 15 uh, and include that, that, in, that information, uh, generator using signature substitute, substitute due to COVID-19. And the generator should provide a signature substitute in a cell phone text message, uh, an email, or a hard copy letter that's mailed to the transporter and designated facility. Um, and that letter or that transmittal can cover all manifest activities um, per transporter or designated facility throughout the generation of the temporary policy. So the policy obviously continues on uh, currently. And so um, you just need to have one letter on file with a transporter and or designated facility uh, that you authorize them to sign on your behalf. Uh, the transporter or designated facility should write in box 14 of the manifest documentation for generator signature substitute available upon request. Uh, and generators and transporters uh, should maintain uh, this documentation. Uh, and this slide shows some example language that you could use to send uh, to the transporter and or designated facility via text, email, or a hard copy letter. Um, so you, see, you can see the wording there. Um, you can authorize uh, the transporter and or designated facility to sign on your behalf. And this is an example of the wording that you would put in that text, email, or a hard copy letter. And you would simply just maintain this on file. Um, and then, of course, the transporter and or designated facility would keep that on file. Uh, for proof, it, you know, in the event that you, you or, or they have an inspection by a state agency or by EPA. And this is what an example would look like um, on the Uniform Hazardous Waste Manifest. You see the information there in Section 14, uh, documentation for generator signature substitute available upon request. So this is in the special handling section of that manifest. And then um, I have my name. And then in the signature block, you can see it says generator using signature substitute due to COVID-19. So um, if any of you are, are anticipating any issues with signing a shipping document at the time of shipment, uh, these are some options that you can use. Now, um, some of you may be aware that there's a separate uh, policy that EPA has, separate from COVID-19 policy, um, can a transporter or other entity sign the generator certification on the hazardous waste manifest on behalf of the generator? And the answer is yes. Um, and I, I've seen this uh, implemented at, at facilities. Um, I've seen it implemented in the retail industry, for example, where um, they have authorized the transporter and or the treatment storage disposal facility to actually sign uh, as the generator on their behalf when they come out and, and uh, pick up the hazardous waste from the facility. 
So yes, an entity such as a transporter or TSDF, other than a generator employee, uh, may sign on behalf of the generator if that entity has a contractual agreement with the generator. Obviously, that's very important uh, as it relates to liability. Um, it's important to have a contractual agreement um, with the transporter or TSDF that's going to sign on, be on your behalf. Um, and so that part of that uh, liability is the transporter and or TSDF, they do um, take on some liability because they're certifying compliance with applicable pre-transportation requirements. So when they come out to um, pick up that hazardous waste, they have to verify that you know the packaging is, packaging is in good condition, all of the containers have been properly marked and labeled and are in good condition for transport. Um, but it does not relieve the generator of liabilities such as uh, cradle to grave and you know um, proper hazardous waste determinations um, profiling of the waste that's being shipped. All right, next topic is EPA's recent update to the ignitable uh, characteristic uh, definition. <clears throat> now some of these changes are administrative. Um, there was a pre-publication of, of the final rule uh, dated June 8th of this year. Um, you can find the definition of ignitability, the ignitability characteristic in 40 CFR uh, 261.21. And the rule will actually be effective 60 days after federal register publication. Um, as of yesterday, I hadn't seen that published yet, but there are pr three primary changes in that update. Um, the first one is, is more administrative and it's more for the laboratories that actually do the testing. Um, EPA is updating SW846 test methods for ignitable liquids. Um, and so uh, there's some ASTM standards that have been updated. They are also codifying existing guidance on the definition of aqueous as it relates to the ignitable characteristic. And then lastly, they're updating some DOT hazmat regulatory references uh, that, uh, as some of you may know, have been, um, were outdated. So um, of course you can find the uh, code of federal regulations at ecfr.gov. And if you go to 40 CFR 261.21, you can find um, EPA's current definition of ignitability, an ignitable hazardous waste. What is EPA's definition of, ign of an ignitable hazardous waste? Um, and so uh, there under uh, section A1, you can see that, um, and this is just part of the ignitability definition. We're not looking at the full complete definition, but if the waste is a liquid, other than an aqueous solution containing less than 24% alcohol by volume and has a flash point less than 140 degrees. Um, if you have a waste that meets that definition, then it, it uh, meets EPA's definition of a hazardous waste. And they indicate in that, um, that paragraph that uh, that can be determined or flash point can be determined by a couple of test methods, uh, Pinsky Martins, as well as the SETA flash. Um, so you see some ASTM standards that are referenced there. Um, those are what are being updated um, as part of this uh, RICRA update. Um, so both of those test methods include references to new updated ASTM standards for performing those tests. Um, and then the current ASTM standards will still be able to be used by the laboratory um, going forward. So uh, the next one is uh, codifying existing guidance on the definition of aqueous. So some of you may be familiar with this exception within the ignitable characteristic definition. So if you have a waste that is uh, a liquid and it's an aqueous solution and it contains less than 24% alcohol by volume and is flammable at a flash point less than 140 degrees then it's accepted from being uh, managed as a hazardous waste. Um, however, EPA has not included the definition of aqueous in the regulations, so they're finally uh, um, codifying that, uh, which you can see here. So what does aqueous mean? As it relates to the ignitability characteristic exclusion, an aqueous solution contains at least 50% water by weight. Um, so that you have to meet that criteria 
if you're going to use that ex that exclusion under the ignitability characteristic. <clears throat> And also EPA is updating um, some references in the ignitable, ignitability characteristic definition for compressed gases, ignitable compressed gases, such as aerosols, uh, butane, other types of um, uh, flammable gases. Of course, if you generate an ignitable compressed gas as a waste, then it meets EPA's definition of an ignitable hazardous waste as well as uh, oxidizers and organic peroxides. Uh, as it relates to organic peroxides, um, they've updated um, some DOT references there. Um, some of the DOT references were, were outdated, so those needed to be updated for both ignitable compressed gases and uh, organic peroxides, as well as um, DOT-defined explosives. So uh, you'll see those uh, codified when, when the uh, rule becomes effective. All right, um, so the next topic is uh, the addition of aerosols uh, to the universal waste rule. <clears throat> the addition of aerosols uh, to the universal waste rule became effective um, just back in February 7th of this year. Um, obviously this is on the federal level and it will take some time for states to actually adopt um, that rule if they choose to. Uh, so the rule by adding aerosols to the universal waste rule is actually less stringent. Therefore, uh, states have the option of not adopting the rule, but I suspect that most states will want to um, adopt uh, aerosols as part of the universal waste rule, primarily because uh, they're generated by, you know, all different types of industries um, and, and it will reduce the regulatory burden on generators, um, allow them to accumulate them um, easier uh, with less restrictions. And obviously when you're managing an aerosol as universal waste, then that waste doesn't count towards your hazardous waste generator status. Um, so they, the, the regulations for managing aerosols as universal waste on the federal level have already been codified uh, in 40 CFR 273. And you can find EPA's definition of an aerosol in uh, 40 CFR 273.9, which is consistent with DOT's definition uh, provided in that reference. Um, some of you probably know that uh, aerosols are already being managed as universal waste in multiple states, um, such as California, Colorado, uh, Utah, Ohio, um, and then those states which automatically adopt uh, federal rule changes um, are, are able to manage um, aerosols as universal waste. But for other states, it will take some time, obviously, for them to go through the regulatory process to formally adopt um, aerosols as universal waste. So um, aerosols that are excluded from uh, the universal waste program, of course, aerosols that are not yet a waste. If it's not a waste, um, you obviously wouldn't want to manage it as a universal waste. Aerosols that are not hazardous waste. Uh, not all aerosols would meet the definition of a hazardous waste, though in most cases they do because of the, you know, most, most aerosols do contain a flammable propellant such as butane, diethyl ether, uh, propane. Um, however, uh, there are non-flammable aerosols out there, lubricants um, that don't have a flammable propellant and, and may be non-hazardous. Um, and then of course aerosols that are empty. Um, and I reference where you can find the defi RICRA's definition of empty at 40 CFR 261.7, um, which you know, in order for an aerosol to be empty, it, you have to re remove um, the contents using the most practical you know, means possible, pouring, pumping, aspirating. Um, and then ensure that there's less than one inch of residue inside an aerosol. And I know, realize that that's difficult to uh, determine. Uh, you can't see inside of an aerosol. So um, some generators choose to puncture them uh, to ensure that those aerosols are completely empty. But if there's no, no propellant, no liquid remaining in an aerosol, technically they are empty. Um, 
uh, EPA does state that EP, empty and non-hazardous aerosols may be managed as universal waste. So it may just be easier um, from a management standpoint to manage them all as universal waste and uh, EPA is okay with that. All right, so what are some of the management standards um, related to managing aerosols as universal waste? Well, we still have some packaging uh, marking and labeling requirements um, that we have to meet. Keep in mind that uh, non-empty aerosols are DOT regulated when shipped off site. So even though they won't be managed on site as hazardous waste, when we ship them off site, uh, they will be regulated by DOT as a hazardous material, a 2.1 uh, flammable gas. Um, but while the aerosols are being accumulated on site in such as a 55 gallon drum, uh, you can see an example uh, label uh, there on the screen. Um, the, the term is universal waste aerosol cans. And there's a couple of other phrases that you can use as well, but that's you know, one of the primary ones. Um, so ensuring that um, if you're accumulating um, aerosols on site as universal waste, that the container is marked and labeled um, with the words universal waste aerosol cans and an accumulation start date. So we do have to demonstrate um, how long the aerosols have been accumulating on site and um, we can store those on site up to one year before, before we were required to ship them off site for uh, recycling or disposal. Um, I also indicated or provided the DOT flammable gas label um, even though it may not be required to put that label on the container during storage, um, it would be a best practice to do that. Obviously, at the time of shipment, it will need to be on, on the container. Um, but uh, as a best practice, I would go ahead and put that label on the container, again, to communicate the hazard of what's being stored in that container. All right, so Within the federal rules, there are some specific requirements for puncturing aerosols. So if your facility um, already is puncturing aerosols, um, uh, I realize that these rules um, may not be adopted in your state, but these are uh, federal requirements for um, puncturing aerosols. They have some specific criteria that we have to meet. Um, they state that we have to use a device that's designed to safely puncture and drain uh, the universal waste can or aerosol can. Uh, we have to develop and, and establish a written procedure. And so, so that would need to be developed and maintained on site. Um, ensuring the puncturing is done in a manner uh, to pre prevent fire and releases to the environment. Um, now, even though your state may not have adopted this, uh, this or aerosols, as universal waste, these obviously are best practices and, and should be implemented uh, anyway. Um, so preventing fire and releases to the environment, um, of course that involves um, using the proper equipment, um, changing the filters as, as necessary, um, puncturing the, the containers in an area that's well ventilated, um, having employees wear you know, proper PPE when this is being done, ensuring that the container is properly grounded. You know, obviously when you're puncturing aerosols, you're, you are emptying uh, flammable propellant and possibly flammable liquids into a container, uh, which can cause static. And uh, um, so the, the container needs to be grounded. Uh, transfer content, transfer contents of the aerosol to a container or tank. Um, so this is typically done to a, a container, you know, usually a, a 30 gallon or a 55 gallon steel container um, because the, you know, the puncturing devices typically are designed for those types of containers. Um, we do have to conduct a hazardous waste determination on the aerosol residues. Um, and you know, the residues that come out of an aerosol can in, in most cases are hazardous waste, um, but you know, each generator needs to perform that, that determination um, and those of you who, who may already perform aerosol puncturing on site, you know that it takes a very long time to, to accumulate enough aerosol residues for, you know, to, to fill a half drum or even a full drum. Um, and then some states um, 
uh, do have uh, limits on satellite accumulation. So if you're, you're in, you know, most cases you're managing the aerosol residues as a satellite accumulation container. Some states do have limits, uh, time limits on, on satellite accumulation. Um, California and Missouri come to mind. Um, and then lastly, a written procedure to address spills and leaks and having a spill kit uh, readily available uh, in that area where aerosols are being punctured. This is uh, one example set up for puncturing aerosols, typically a drum type uh, setup uh, where you have a, a single can puncturer and a filter uh, on the drum top. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the aerosol residues typically um, are hazardous waste, you know, either because of the propellant and or the liquids uh, that are out of those aerosols. And so you would, assuming that the container is hazardous waste, you would place a hazardous waste label on the container and as a best practice indicate, you know, what type of waste is being accumulated in that container, in this case, you know, waste aerosol residues. Um, I don't have an accumulation start date on the container. Uh, in most states, um, you have, in, you know, indefinite storage time for satellite accumulation, but in those states where you're limited to uh, satellite accumulation as far as a time limit, then you obviously would put a accumulation start date to indicate the satellite accumulation start date. All right, um, next topic is a generators and generator improvements rule. Um, so this has actually been effective uh, for a few years now, um, but states, as you probably know, have been slow to actually adopt the changes. Um, so many states still have not adopted a generator improvements rule. Um, and it's, it's, it's very beneficial in, in many ways. Um, it, it does update the hazardous waste rules, which were initially promulgated 40 years ago. Um, it does simplify the regulations. They're actually more user-friendly, believe it or not. Um, the way that they're organized now on the federal level, um, it's easier to identify the requirements that you're subject to. Uh, there's less cross-referencing to other parts of the 40 CFR and they've also codified some guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's over 60 changes. Um, some of those changes include greater flexibility for episodic generators, um, where if you have one event during the year that causes you to be uh, either a small quantity or a large quantity generator because of a one-time event, um, there is um, some uh, procedure that we can go through to uh, basically notify the state or EPA of that one-time event, and but also at the same time maintain our generator status. There is a more stringent requirement for small quantity generators now. They must re-notify uh, the state or EPA uh, at least once every four years. Um, there's additional requirements added to contingency plans. So for large quantity generators, um, there are some additional uh, things that have to be added to a contingency plan. Uh, there's some ambiguities and some concepts that have been clarified in satellite accumulation. Um, as many of you know, the conditionally exempt small quantity generator term or name has changed to very uh, small quantity generator. Um, states will have to adopt the more stringent portion of the rule, but obviously have the option of adopting the less stringent parts of the rule. So what are the more stringent changes? For small quantity generators, um, you have to re-notify the state um, or EPA um, at least every four years. In, in most cases, in most states, obviously, it'll be the state that you're sending the notification to. Um, for both small and large quantity generators, satellite accumulation areas now are subject to incompatibility and emergency preparedness and prevention requirements. Um, for both small and large quantity generators, we now have to identify the hazard of the waste being accumulated. So in addition to the hazardous waste label uh, that's on the container, we also have to include um, a marking to or a label to identify the hazard of the, of the waste that's being accumulated there. Um, large quantity generators um, now have a requirement to notify of closure of 90 day storage areas. Uh, and EPA is now requiring for large quantity generators, if a 90 day area cannot be properly closed, then closure as a landfill is required. 
Um, and then lastly, for large quantity generators, we must include a quick reference guide for contingency plans. All right, so EPA does have a, a website that tracks the status of um, the generator improvement rule and what states have adopted and which states have not. So er, all the states that are in yellow have neither adopted or, authorized, or been authorized by EPA uh, to implement the generator improvements rule. So it looks like about half the states um, have not yet adopted or been authorized by EPA. Um, the ones, uh, the states that are in blue have adopted the rule, but have not been formally authorized by EPA to implement the program. And then the ones in green have both adopted and been authorized by EPA. Of course, uh, for Iowa and Alaska, uh, that's administrated uh, by EPA, so they're automatically, the generator improvement rules automatically implemented there. All right, so reorganization of the rules. Um, this is one of the better parts of the change is that um, if you go to the 40 CFR, you will see that um, the regulations have been organized much better and they're much more user friendly. Uh, if you look at um, the summary on the right, you can see that they detail um, what they call conditions for exemption for uh, the different generators, small, very small, and large quantity. Conditions for exemption, that term is kind of odd, but it means uh, conditions for exemption from, a, from being required to obtain a permit. So as long as you meet those conditions as a small or a large quantity generator, uh, you're not required to get a formal uh, Part B permit to manage hazardous waste on site. So, Part of um, the, the, the generator improvement rule, uh, they have um, provided more uh, prescriptive uh, language on how a hazardous waste determination should be conducted and what documentation uh, should be maintained. Um, that determination must be made at the point of generation before any dilution mixing, mixing or other alteration of the waste occurs. And of course, determinations must be accurate. Uh, and, and just uh, speaking from someone who periodically does on-site audits, um, this is one of the things that's very easy for an auditor to find is that where a facility has not performed hazardous waste determinations on all of the waste generated on-site. So uh, the, the language now is more prescriptive. prescriptive. We should have documentation that describes um, the waste that we generate and whether that waste is a hazardous waste, a non-hazardous waste, universal waste, um, and then some supporting documentation uh, for that waste determination, be it uh, safety data sheets or process information um, or laboratory data to support that determination. So the small quantity generator not notification, again, um, uh, for most states, the small quantity generators will, will basically, at least every four years, um, have to submit a re-notification to that state. Um, now, in states, there are some states that require annual reporting for small quantity generators. So that's, that's actually more stringent, obviously, than, than this rule. Um, so for those states that already have annual reporting, then this notification won't be required. Um, but for those states that don't require small quantity generators to do an annual notification, um, at a minimum, every four years will be required. And that begins September 1st, uh, 2021, and then every four years thereafter. For small quantity and large quantity generators, satellite accumulation areas are subject to incompatibility and emergency preparedness and prevention requirements. So um, now most generators probably had already been implementing uh, these practices, but it's been codified now. Uh, in the rule um, so that obviously incompatible waste cannot be mixed in the same container. Incompatible waste must be segregated in the area. So if you generated, for example, acids and caustic material, you would obviously segregate those in your um, satellite accumulation area. Uh, and then remove any excess hazardous waste, more than 55 gallons, to the collection accumulation area within three calendar days. So part of um, meeting those emergency preparedness and prevention requirements is ensuring that emergency equipment is readily available uh, in the event that there is a spill or some other type of 
uh, incident involving hazardous waste, um, having internal communications readily available, um, spill kits, fire control equipment. Of course, small quantity generators are required to have emergency response information posted next to a telephone that would be used in the event of an emergency. Or it could also be posted in an area directly involved in the generation or accumulation of hazardous waste, so posted um, at the satellite accumulation area and or the 90 day storage area, or I should say 180 day storage area for small quantity generators. And emergency response information includes uh, emergency coordinator contact information, emergency equipment location. In other words, where you have emergency equipment located throughout the facility, and then the telephone number of the fire department. All right, so um, another new requirement for small quantity and large quantity generators, we now have to indicate the hazard of the hazardous waste um, that we are accumulating both at satellite accumulation areas as well as collection accumulation areas or you know what your 180 day or 90 day storage area and there are various ways that you can do that um, and these are just some examples um, of identifying the hazard of the waste we can use an OSHA hazard pictogram to identify the hazard we can use a DOT marking the NFPA uh, chemical hazard label, uh, the global harmonization system pictogram, which is obviously the same as OSHA. And then um, you can simply mark uh, the hazard on the container as well. So those are different options that you can use um, to identify the hazard. Now, obviously states can be more stringent, they may specify, but uh, I suspect that there'll be some flexibility on how the hazard can be communicated and, and this just shows the flexibility that you have. Um, now, probably the most practical thing to do would be to go ahead and put the DOT hazard warning label on the container. Uh, the, when you had the first drop of waste that goes in the container, you would have your hazardous waste label and, and also I would put the DOT hazard warning label because you, you eventually are gonna have to ship that waste off site. So you would already have it um, pre-marked with the, the proper DOT hazard warning label. Um, so EPA now requires uh, what's called a quick reference guide for large quantity generators, which are subject to developing and maintaining a hazardous waste contingency plan. Uh, so these additional eight elements are required to be included as a quick reference guide um, in your contingency plan. When the plan is uh, ready for update, you would include um, these quick reference guide elements in that plan and submit that um, to your uh, local uh, emergency responders and agencies such as the police department, fire department, local hospital. Um, and of course, that could be sent hard copy or electronically. Um, if, you, if you're using um, a third party emergency response contractor, of course, they would need to copy as well. Now on the federal level, the contingency plan no longer requires the home address and home telephone numbers uh, of emergency coordinators. Um, that's been a point of contention for, uh, for I, I know many generators of having to put you know, personal information in the contingency plan that gets sent to um, local response agencies. Now your state may still require it. Of course, if, if you haven't, if the state hasn't adopted this rule, then this is still gonna be required, that that information is still required in the contingency plan. <clears throat> so just be aware of that. All right, so some of the less stringent changes as part of the generator improvements rule that are not required to be adopted by the states include what's called a very small quantity generator consolidation. So if, if you're a company that has multiple locations and some of those locations are classified as a very small quantity generator, then they can actually ship their waste to another company owned facility that is a large quantity generator. Another less stringent requirement is what's called the episodic generation. Um, and this is very beneficial for facilities um, where, you know, if you have, you know, if you typically have an episodic event, maybe once a year or once every two years, and it causes you to go from small quantity generator to large quantity generator. Uh, well, now there is a, a process to go through to where if you follow through with the process, you can maintain your generator status. 
Um, so it won't cause you to be a, for example, a large quantity generator for the whole year. Um, you can maintain your, uh, your generator status as long as you follow the notification protocols. And also there's a waiver from the 50 foot rule, um, uh, storing ignitable waste at least 50 feet from the property line. There's a waiver for that. Um, if you get approval from the local fire, uh, fire um, marshal. Regarding episodic generation, uh, previous RICRA rules lacked flexibility to address an episodic um, hazardous waste generation event that affect, you know, affects one's generator status, such as a tank clean out, or you know, maybe you have an upset condition or a large spill, uh, which can be planned, obviously or planned or unplanned. Um, so now there's a new part 262 subpart L, which allows generators um, to, that have an episodic event um, to basically uh, maintain their generator status under streamlined conditions. Um, the hazardous waste that is part of the episodic event that's generated as part of the episodic event doesn't count towards one's generator status as long as you meet those conditions in part 262 uh, subpart L. What EPA says is that one episodic event is allowed per year uh, plus one additional opportunity uh, to petition EPA um, or an authorized second event. So if you have a, for example, a planned uh, tank clean out, um, so for planned events, you're required to notify, in most cases, it'll be the state uh, within 30 days prior uh, on a site ID form. Uh, if you have an unplanned event, such as an upset condition or a large spill that would cause you to be, you know, have a change in generator status, then you have to notify um, the state and or EPA uh, with, uh, within 72 hours by phone um, or email and send the site ID form in. All hazardous waste that is generated as part of that episodic event uh, must be shipped off site within 60 days. Um, now, if you're a very small quantity generator, and you already don't have an EPID number and you have an episodic event that would cause you to be either a small or a large quantity generator, then you will have to obtain an EPA identification number. Um, so again, just want to reiterate that uh, states may choose not to adopt um, this episodic uh, generation um, uh, because in some cases um, it does generate less revenue for some states that may not be the primary reason but um, they may choose it because it is a less stringent requirement they may choose not to adopt uh, this part of the rule. So a very small quantity cons uh, generator consolidation to large quantity generators as I mentioned EPA allows a very small quantity generator to send their waste to a large quantity generator under the under the control of the same person. A person includes but is not limited to an individual, corporation, partnership, state, or municipality. And there's some specific procedures to follow. Um, the very small quantity generator would mark and label hazardous waste containers with the words hazardous waste and the hazards. However, no hazardous waste manifest is required. So you would basically use a bill of lading um, to ship that that waste uh, from, from your very small quantity generator location to your large quantity generator location. And in most cases, uh, that, that waste would still be DOT regulated, even though it's um, uh, a hazardous waste manifest is not required. So a large quantity generator that receives very small quantity generator waste must uh, notify the state on a site ID form uh, maintain record keeping of each shipment. Um, when you receive that waste, you would add the accumulation start date to the very small quantity generator labels. And on the biennial hazardous waste report, a very small quantity generator uh, waste has its own source code. So there's a way of identifying um, waste on the biennial report that, it, that the source of that waste is from one of your very small quantity generators. Also, as part of this generator improvement rule, um, EPA is more prescript prescriptive on generators determining their generator category. Um, so all hazardous waste generators must determine 
uh, that are generator category by counting the total amount of hazardous waste generated in each calendar month. Um, count separately the amount of acutely hazardous waste versus non-acutely hazardous waste. So the acutely hazardous waste, as you probably know, um, is primarily the P-listed uh, hazardous waste, commercial chemical products. Um, there's a few um, F-listed wastes that are also acutely hazardous. Um, so basically we have to prove um, what our generator status is uh, by, you know, the most practical way would be to keep a log, you know, whether it's weekly or monthly to show how much hazardous waste has been generated for that, for that week or for that month. Generators must add RICRA waste codes on hazardous waste labels before shipping waste off site. Now, in most cases, this is already done. Um, and I, I realize that uh, you, the, the hazardous waste vendor that you use, um, they typically provide completed labels at the time of shipment or they mail them to you in advance of a shipment and they should already be pre-marked um, with not only the EPA waste codes but also the proper DOT shipping description at the bottom of that hazardous waste label. Um, as you know, the, the label itself the hazardous waste label is meant to meet both EPA and DOT requirements from a marking perspective. And so some of the information on the label is there for to meet EPA requirements and some of the information is there to meet uh, DOT requirements such as the DOT shipping description. Um, and I, I mentioned that uh, EPA is more prescriptive now on waste determinations. Um, and so an inspector uh, would expect that the profile or waste determination would have some supporting information, um, a description of the process, safety data sheets, or laboratory data. Of course, you know, we, we can use generator knowledge to perform a hazardous waste determination, but that information needs to be documented. Um, and for uh, small and large quantity generators, we have to maintain uh, waste determinations on site for at least three years. Uh, and I provide some examples, again, of some supporting documentation for waste terminations, uh, which are listed there. Um, and we should also identify applicable waste codes um, that apply for those waste terminations, if it is, in fact, a hazardous waste. All right, um, so that, that wraps up uh, the, uh, the updates that I wanted to cover. Um, Leo, do we have any, any questions that we need to address? We do, yes. Nice job, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, we've got maybe five questions right now. So our first question, is there any sign or label on the can to show that it's universal or just consider the non-flammable logo? Presumably they're talking about aerosol cans. Yes, so um, similar to other universal waste, you know, such as lamps or batteries, uh, you're required to mark the container of universal waste with the proper wording, um, such as universal waste lamps or universal waste batteries. And in this case, it's universal waste cans, aerosol cans, sorry, universal waste aerosol cans. So that marking uh, needs to be on the container as well as an accumulation start date. Okay, and then a follow-up to that, is there a volume limit for aerosol containers? A volume limit for for aerosol containers. Um, or for the aerosols container, I guess this is the perhaps the drum that you're, or, or the good large question. container. That's a good question. Um, so typically it would be in a 55 gallon drum. I believe Gaylord boxes would be authorized and I would refer to the DOT requirements. Really DOT is what's gonna drive that, the restriction. Um, so, because I mentioned that D they are regulated when shipped off site by DOT as a hazardous material, so um, the packaging requirements um, would, would be DOT packaging requirements, and, and DOT does have some exceptions for waste, ba for waste aerosols, and I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I could, I could certainly follow up via email with that question. Okay. Uh, next question, for episodic events, if you're not expecting a hazardous waste, but the key clip results come back positive, when does the 72-hour window and 60-day window begin? 
Is it the date of the lab results or the yeah. date that the waste is created? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, and if you need to get back to them. Yeah, uh, that, well, that's a good one. Uh, it's a good question. And you might need to think about that and okay. provide a little bit more, uh, see if I can find some interpretations that. Okay, yeah, Logan, we'll, uh, we'll get an answer for you, uh, email to you. Okay. Um, our next question. We often see generators that manage production debris, such as rags, wipes, uh, swabs, masking paper, et cetera, as D001, mm -hmm. even though there is no liquid present. Right. Can you clarify the applicability of D001 for these scenarios or not? Yeah, sure. Um, so under the ignitability characteristic, um, there, there is a definition for ignitable solids where you, if you have a solid that has the potential to ignite uh, through friction or some other means, and when it ignites, it burns vigorously, so it has to meet those two conditions, then it would be considered an ignitable um, hazardous waste, even though it's solid in form. Um, so uh, there is a, a part, the two parts of that uh, definition, part of it is generator knowledge. The other part can be verified through an analytical test. Um, and I can't think of it off the top of my head, but uh, I could also follow up with that, that specific information. Okay. Yeah. And our last question so far is, can you send your punctured aerosol cans to a metal recycler? And if so, must you keep them separate and label them per RICRA and DOT? Good question. Um, so they should be able to be sent to a scrap metal recycling facility. Um, you would you would want to contact them in advance and make sure that they could accept it. Um, some some scrap metal recyclers may not want them. Um, some others are fine with them, and you do not have to segregate them from other scrap metal unless the scrap metal vendor uh, requests it. Probably would be a best practice to, to segregate them, but. Uh, I'm not aware of any requirement that would require you to segregate different types of scrap metal. You could, you could send it, you know, put it all together in one container and send it to the scrap metal uh, vendor. However, it may be best practice to separate it because you might get better pricing for, you know, by segregating different types of scrap metal. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions. Uh, so I'll make a few uh, closing uh, comments here. Um, it, for everybody that registered for this webinar, we will email you a certificate uh, of attendance here in the, uh, the next uh, few days. Uh, keep in mind, we don't have a good means to see who actually registers and who actually literally signs in to the uh, presentation. So we just send out their certificates to everybody that, uh, that registered. If you're, uh, you can view this webinar, you will be able to view this webinar on our website in a few days when it's posted. All four of our previous webinars are posted on our website if you'd like to view those uh, as well. And Kevin has put up here our flyer for our EHS educational series. You can see we've got uh, three more left over the next three weeks. And I know some of you are registered uh, for those. And if you still want to register for any of those, you're welcome uh, to do so. And lastly, I uh, will be sending an email here uh, in just a moment that's got a copy of the uh, PowerPoint slides that Kevin presented today, also a link to a survey, a four question, very short survey. And we would certainly appreciate any feedback you can provide on today's uh, webinar. Uh, so thanks uh, very much, everybody. I don't see any more questions. Oh, wait, it looks like we might have one more here. Oh, no, it's just uh, somebody saying that it, uh, we've done a good job. Great. All right, everyone, thanks uh, very much. Have a great day, and hopefully we'll see some of you uh, next week.